Hey everybody, we're going to start talking today about how to get started on your genealogy. Things that I wish I knew when I started. Um, many times when I do public speaking, people come up afterwards and they say, I just don't know where to start. I have piles of papers, I have all sorts of information and documents, and I just don't know where to begin. So I think we'll start with um, doing a couple of um, presentations about how to get started when you don't want to do things digitally necessarily, you're not sure how to input information on the computer, um, but you want to get started and, and um, get organized. So we're going to start today with what you know. And everyone has uh, members in their family who know things about the family history. You may have elders in your family, grandparents, aunts, uncles. You may have children with stories, cousins with stories. And so reach out and survey your family and ask questions. Uh, sometimes bringing out photos will help spark someone's memory, particularly someone who's older. And the other thing you want to do when you bring out photos and things like that is either with a tape recorder or with a notepad, capture what they say about the photo. Where was it taken? Who was in the picture? Uh, many people have boxes of family photos and no identifiable names or dates or places. So try to catch that if you can. Um, collect up your photos and stories and recollections and cite where you found them. Uh, in genealogy, there is a very specific way to cite sources. And it's not complicated, but it is cumbersome. Uh, most professional genealogists would agree that it's necessary. Uh, but in the beginning, probably the most important thing to do is to just write notes to yourself about where you found something. You found it at your local library. It was something that your great aunt Betty told you. So those are the kind of things to keep in mind as you're collecting up things, is to note where you found it. Where was that family Bible? And who had access to that particular birth certificate or, or probate file. So consider how you'd like to get organized. Maybe you want to use software, or you want to scan things, or you've heard people talk about having an online family tree. Um, and maybe you just want to be a paper and notebook kind of person. And all of those are perfectly fine. Just keep in mind how you're interested in filing and being organized when you start. And then consider, always consider, how are you preserving it? How are you distributing it? Where is this information going to go when you're finished? Um, where is it going to go at the end of your life? And you know, the tragedy is that you spend a lot of time and effort and energy and money, and no one else ever sees it. So try to keep that in mind as you're working. What's the end game? Am I going to publish something? Am I going to preserve it? Am I going to donate it somewhere? Am I going to find someone in my family who's interested and is going to carry on? One of the things that, um, that I tell beginning genealogists to do is to start with the chart. And you can find all sorts of five-generation ancestor charts or other kinds of charts online. You can find PDFs of them that you can print. Uh, you can find them at a lot of local libraries and genealogy rooms and archives. They, they tend to have a stack of those ready to go. But you would start with where your name fits in, right here under me. And then you add your father, and your father's father, and your father's mother. And then on the bottom tier, you have your mom, and your mother's father, and your mother's mother. And you want to make sure that you fill in as much information as you know, birth and death and marriage. And you want to include not just the dates, but you want to include um, places as well. Places are crucial sometimes to figuring out uh, when you get to the end of your chart and you don't know where to go and you don't have the next set of parents to add, uh, places can be really valuable. So if you can track as much of that information in one place as possible, that's great. There also are, if you look, notice up here, number one on the chart is the same as number blank on another chart. So once you get to the end of the chart, of the fifth generation, if you have more information about more generations, there is a way to 
uh, add on more charts and make yourself a larger and larger set of charts. So that's one thing that I recommend doing, just to kind of house that information that you think you already know. The other thing to keep in mind is how many ancestors do you really have? Uh, the numbers can get quite large quite quickly. So um, I just took a screenshot here of if you um, start with yourself and then you add your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents, there's a mathematical model here where you're, you have the increase every time. And by the sixth great grandparents, you have 256 family names. Um, and that's assuming no overlap of ancestors, no duplicate names, things like that. So um, the most that you would have for biological ancestors would be 256 sixth great grandparents. So you can notice that the numbers get quite unwieldy quickly. Um, also, assuming that you're born in around 1950, um, this is about how far back you would be with your six great grandparents. And again, those are approximations based on, you know, the fact that maybe you're uh, 65 years old right now. So um, the other thing to keep in mind uh, to be successful is that we have a huge library system in the United States. Ask a local librarian. Um, this uh, particular talk I'm giving in Delaware County, Ohio, and so even if you don't have Delaware County, Ohio ancestors, but that's your closest library, go there and ask. Uh, the other thing that they have at libraries that's unique is that they have databases that are library subscriptions. So if you don't want to pay for a subscription to Ancestry, for example, you can use the library edition of Ancestry. Uh, so, and there are library editions of lots of different databases, um, FamilySearch.org, HeritageQuest, and so on. So a local librarian or a local volunteer in a genealogy room of a library is a great place to start. Uh, the other thing I recommend to succeed is to find a buddy, find a genealogy buddy, and set aside time weekly and schedule it. So if you have a genealogy buddy, uh, you have someone that you're accountable with. They may or may not be interested in researching the same things you are, but just like exercise or any other habit that you want to start and continue, um, it's good to have someone who will sit with you, work with you, and maybe you meet every Monday evening for two hours, or maybe um, you meet during the day uh, every other Thursday. So find someone who can um, spend some time with you. And maybe there are things that you know how to do that they don't, and vice versa, so you can learn from one another. It would be great if we could find a genealogy buddy that was researching the same things we were, but that doesn't always happen. So at least start with someone who is uh, committed to researching and, and building that habit as much as you are. And then set aside that time weekly and schedule it. So particularly if you're a retiree and you have a lot of free time and you start filling it up, uh, some of the retirees I know are busier than anyone else. Uh, so set aside the time that you're going to do it kind of early in the day or early in the evening, whatever's your best time to concentrate and schedule that and try to kind of build a habit there um, for maybe a couple of months and see how that goes as far as your uh, level of success. The other thing that I really suggest for being a successful genealogist is getting maps, lots and lots of maps. Now you can get current maps. Um, most rest areas and rest stops in different states have maps. You can also, um, in general, a lot of states, I live in the state of Ohio, we have a county engineer system, and each county engineer produces a map. A lot of those are free if you send a self-addressed stamped envelope. A lot of them are a dollar or something like that. So if you uh, send a dollar and a self-addressed stamped envelope, they'll send you back a map of that county. And you should have maps of all the counties and all the states that you're planning to research people in. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to all those places to research. However, if you do, you'll be a little bit more prepared. But it does mean that if you have maps available, you can locate cemeteries. Uh, you can order some of the older maps and find land records or farms, and those are called plat maps. Um, you also want to be, be able to look at townships or boroughs and maps so that you can understand the census 
Uh, the census is based on a township system or a, a smaller enumeration district. So you want to make sure that you have access to what are those smaller pieces of things look like. Um, and if there are large cities, let's say, for example, you have a lot of uh, ancestors in the Philadelphia area, get some maps of the city of Philadelphia, write to the chambers of commerce. Uh, a lot of them you can do online. You can order maps online. So um, the other thing you might want to consider is some special maps, like ethnic area maps. Um, I know when I was in college in Toledo, Ohio, there were certain specific ethnic areas and ethnic neighborhoods, and there was a map of those in the city of Toledo. So you could find the Polish neighborhood or the Hungarian neighborhood. Um, and then there are immigration maps, and a lot of these are available online. I just have a little snapshot of one here um, for 1820 to 1860, and where did the predominant uh, groups settle. So there are lots of information about immigration and migration, but in order to get started, at least get local and city and state and county maps of the places where you have ancestors, and then consider looking for township maps. Um, I don't often recommend Wikipedia as any sort of source, but Wikipedia has done a, a pretty good job, the people who contribute to Wikipedia have done a pretty good job of um, collecting up maps and giving township information and how township needs to change. Um, I happen to live in Franklin County, Ohio, and this is a township map of Franklin County, Ohio from the 1930s. Now, townships are a Northwest Territory um, kind of unique thing uh, that was set up when people were given land grants. So perhaps they fought in the Revolutionary War, and in lieu of payment for the war, they were given a tract of land. And townships have a very unique history of being set up as a six square, six mile by six miles, 36 square mile area. Um, each particular parcel has room for a meeting house, a church, a school. So there are a lot of different uh, things to learn about townships. And, um, but one of the things to keep in mind is a lot of times in the early 1800s, even late 1700s, people listed their birth as a township, not necessarily a city or a county. Uh, the counties changed a lot over time. County boundaries changed. Um, counties were split into smaller units. So the townships have remained fairly consistent, at least in uh, Ohio, Indiana, the Northwest territories. So it's something to think about. And for every county where I have ancestors, I have a township map that correlates to that so that I can determine where, where were they and you know, where were the land parcels? Where were the railroads? Where were the rivers? Another thing to keep in mind for success is that Facebook is for more than photos of your grandchildren. Um, a lot of people who uh, use Facebook use it for social media, keeping in touch with family who's distant and that sort of thing. There are lots of Facebook groups related to your particular ancestor or your particular region. So all you need to do on Facebook is go into the search mechanism and input a family name or input a location or input a genealogical society. So Franklin County uh, Genealogical Society for Ohio and see what comes up. Is there a group? Are there people researching things? Are there people posting pictures about um, maybe the turn of the century or photos of businesses or photos of people? and it's a place where you can ask questions, meet other people in your local, interested in your local area or perhaps in your local area, and get some of your questions answered. So that's a really good tool to use as a beginning genealogist if you're on Facebook. Um, if you're not on Facebook, probably one of the things to keep in mind is maybe you should consider joining. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to come to that conclusion, and I'll you know, you can decide that for yourself. But if you're already there, it's a really good spot for genealogists. Uh, one of the things that I tell people a lot is to organize what you have, but then think about what your assumptions are. So we're going to talk for a little bit about what are your genealogical assumptions, where did they come from, what is it that, that you glean from that, and then how do you use your assumptions to 
further your research. So one, one thing I recommend is making a list of your assumptions. And then try to prove each one or think of alternate theories about it. So I'm going to go through a couple examples of where I had assumptions in my genealogical research that turned out to be completely wrong. And uh, here's how I found out about that. Uh, in uh, Champaign County, Ohio, um, a little bit west of the capital city of Columbus, uh, there is a little town called St. Paris. And I have a lot of um, German ancestors, the Offenbeckers, uh, and a whole set of family groups that came around the same time in the 1700s and early 1800s. They came from Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, to Ohio. And one of the things that I found when I went to the St. Paris Library was I found a book about the cemeteries of Champaign County. And of course, I want to check out every Champaign County cemetery there is. And one of the pages had this lovely photo of the Offenbacher Cemetery. And I'm thinking, wow, look what I have found. It's just north of Ward Road. It's just west of the railroad track. How hard could that be find? hard to find? Look at those headstones. So I pulled the other information out of the book, and it gave a description. The Offenbacher Cemetery, Champaign County, Johnson Township. It gave the legend of different things here. It shows the distance from the roads and all of that. I took the little piece of the Google map and I said, well, here's the railroad. It's just west of the railroad and just north of Ward Road. So it must be right here, right? Then what happens is I get in the car with my mom and we drive to that corner and we're looking and it's a farm field and we don't see it. We see a little clump of trees. We walk around a little bit. We really don't see it. And so then we drive up to Trestle Road, which is the next road north, and we try to look at it from that direction. Um, and it's an elevated train track, so we did not get on the train tracks. That's the dangerous thing. We didn't do that. Um, but we thought, you know, well, maybe the train tracks have moved. Maybe it's not really Ward Road. Maybe it's another road. We started going through that. And then what we decided to do was we collected up the addresses of all the people who lived on Ward Road and Trestle Road, and we just took up down the addresses from each mailbox, and I believe there were five uh, residents in that area, and we wrote to each one of them. And we just said, look, you know, we're looking for the cemetery, you know, the, the book says it's here, it looks visible, we should see it. And every single one of those very kind people either wrote back or called me and said, we don't remember there ever being a cemetery here. So, you know, sometimes we make assumptions based on the photo in a book. And when we look at the photo in a book, like this photo here, and we think, wow, this is really beautiful. So I go back to the library, and I ask the librarian. I said, you know what? I went looking for the cemetery. I found a small clump of trees. It's in the right place, north of Ward Road, west of the railroad track. What's the deal? And the librarian says to me, oh, that's not a photo of the Offenbecker Cemetery. That's just a generic photo that someone put in the book to make it interesting. So my assumption was that that was a photo of the cemetery, uh, and it was not. So just keep in mind that sometimes uh, we go to libraries and archives or we read something online, and we have an assumption about where something is, and it's just not there. The, uh, it's still an unsolved mystery 10 years later. One of the other assumptions that people make is that my name has always been spelled like this. Uh, my spelling of the name is the only spelling of the name. All the other people who have it spelled differently are a different lineage. And more often than not, that's just not true. Um, I have a Scottish family name, Calderwood, and I have found records with all of the other, all of these other Calderwood spellings. <laughs> and in some way or another, they were related to the Calderwood that I was looking for. A lot of the misspelling comes from the census, where census workers are hearing something, writing it down, and then it's not quite right. <laughs> um, some people uh, have talked about how maybe their name was changed at Ellis Island. 
that really didn't happen as often as people claim it did. I'm sure it did happen sometimes, but there are lots of reasons why names are misspelled. I have Offenbeckers that I talked about previously um, who are cousins in the same cemetery with two different spellings of the name. So it is not as uncommon as you might think. And if the headstones are spelled differently and it's the same family, um, you know, set in concrete, right? So I also have a, just a little anecdotal story about um, I was working with a lady who was researching her ancestors in Erie, Pennsylvania. And she had a group, a family group, that all had the same spelling of the name. And I don't, I didn't ask permission to use the name, so I don't want to release the name. But she, um, she couldn't find another group that she knew was in Erie around the same time. And I, I said to her, I said, well, what about the other spellings of the name? And they were in Erie Cemetery, which is a, a pretty enormous cemetery, tens of thousands of names. And she, she says, oh, no, this is the only way they ever spelled it. And, and we had a little discussion about that. And I said, well, let's just try it and see. And we were on Find a Grave, um, the website Find a Grave. And so we put in some alternate spelling. And sure enough, I mean, they were there. And she was stunned. She's like, well, they spelled it wrong. And I said, well, it's not spelled wrong. It's just spelled differently. But it is the same family group. It is the same man and woman you were looking for. It is the same set of children you were looking for. They just spelled it differently. So don't let the singular spelling of your name preclude you finding all the other ways it could have been spelled differently. One of the other things that I tell people uh, pretty commonly is uh, there was a legend in my family. I will say legend because I don't believe it's true, but my fifth great great first fifth great grandfather was born in the Highlands of Scotland and he had a castle. And there's a picture that's floating around in our family of Calderwood Castle. It's not my Calderwood family. <laughs> and so it, there are oftentimes um, people make up stories or they assume stories or they're so interested in being related to someone famous or royalty or that sort of thing that they just let that absorb them. So I think we have to always consider, well, just because the castle is named with the same surname as my family, that it may not be the same, may not be the same family. The other thing uh, that happens a lot is people lie. Um, there's a story in our family about uh, a grandfather that was a terrible person and a fallen Catholic, and he was buried on the perimeter of the Catholic cemetery outside the fence in Patterson, New Jersey. And what the person who told us that, I mean, told us that for many, many, many years. Um, so what's the obvious plan of attack here as a genealogist? You march around every Catholic cemetery in Patterson, New Jersey. You walk the perimeter. You <laughs> get stuck in the poison ivy. And you're looking for this person who's on the perimeter outside the fence in Patterson, New Jersey, in a Catholic cemetery. I spent years on trips back and forth out east um, to see if I could find the headstone. The truth is, he wasn't in Patterson, he's not in a Catholic cemetery, and he's not on the perimeter. He's actually in a cemetery in Pennsylvania. It's not a Catholic cemetery, and he's not on the perimeter. And to make that point, let me just show you this slide. The grandfather is right next to his wife and her second husband. So people in the family knew exactly where he was buried, they knew exactly how to find him, and they were untruthful about that. And we stumbled upon his grave in searching for hers. One of the other assumptions that people make is about the size of cities and how many family records there are. I apologize for this kind of fuzzy photo here, but I have an ancestor, uh, a third great grandfather, John W. Reed, who was born in Baltimore in February 14th of 1807. I'm thinking, how am I ever going to find a John Reed in a large city in 1807? How is that going to happen? And it wasn't until I looked at the city directories, which is kind of another uh, way to talk about the phone book, 
uh, city directory usually had people's addresses and people's occupations. This is from that same time period. I think it's around 1810. This is a page out of the city directory in Baltimore for the read. And look how few there are there. I would have expected it to be like today's phone book with hundreds, if not thousands, of reads. And what it came down to here is in 1810, there are just half a dozen or so. So that's not such a large number to look at. So if you have common names and you're trying to tie, and you tie them to a location and you're trying to determine the next set of ancestors back, who are John Reed's parents? And this is a very short list. Um, so it's, it's something that might help you break through that brick wall, that tough question that you have. Of course, the other issue is that Baltimore wasn't just a city, it was also a county. So you do have to take into account that it may not have been, uh, John Reed might have not have been in Baltimore City. Uh, he could have been born in Baltimore County. But at least this narrows down the list. I would have expected hundreds of names. Another major assumption that I often hear is that I can find everything I need on the internet. <laughs> why do I need to go to an archive? Why do I need to go to a library? Or why do I need to join a historical society? And it is true that you can find a lot on the internet. You can actually find more every day, all the time. Collections are expanding. Digitization is at a record pace. And lots of groups have dedicated themselves to digitizing records. Um, but there are lots of local sources and one-of-a-kind resources that you can only find in one place. Until they are digitized, you can only find them on a location or site. Genealogical societies do a tremendous amount of work. They index those books that are hard to search. They index records to speed up your searching. They have all sorts of contributions and efforts. They also have something called a vertical file in almost every archive I've ever been in. And the vertical file can be location-based, or maybe it's a vertical file. It's just a file folder about uh, a company that was local. But oftentimes, they have vertical files or surname files. So you can find a folder full of things about the surname Reed. And it may not be your Reed family, but it might be a five-generation chart that someone has printed and sent to them. It might be newspaper clippings, obituary clippings, and things like that that the Genealogy Society has just compiled over the years. It might also be correspondence. I found many, many cousins by looking through the vertical files at local sites and determining, wow, this cousin has been writing to them for a decade. I'm going to figure out who that person is and write to them. So there are lots of nuggets of things that you can find at the local level. If you don't live near where your ancestors are and where you're researching, there are local people who will look at those things and research for you. Uh, some are for free and some are for a fee. And some are free if you join their, their organization. And maybe joining is 10 or $15. And you can join their organization and get a certain number of hours or a certain number of requests free. So well worth the time and effort to invest in your local and genealogical society. They also have almost everyone that I belong to has wonderful newsletters and interesting tidbits and facts and, and uh, updates members all the time on what they have available at their site and what their new collections are. And also, almost every genealogical society has an online presence. They either have a Facebook page, a website, a Roots web page, or all the above. So um, those are a wonderful place to get records, even if you're on the internet and you're using them in that capacity. Uh, the other thing that you can find, um, where you can find genealogical information is parks and monuments and cemeteries. I was hiking uh, in a local um, nature preserve in Ohio called Davy Woods, again in Champaign County. And I stumbled across this sign for the Pence Family Cemetery. And this is my family. Uh, David Pence married Barbara Offenbecker from Shenandoah County, Virginia. And they moved 
in the early 1800s. Uh, they purchased land and lived here, so almost 200 years in Ohio. And when I was at the cemetery, I stumbled upon um, the local the tombstones that uh, the local genealogical society had attempted to preserve. They put the remaining broken pieces into concrete and laid them flat on the ground. Um, but this is David Pence's headstone and his wife Barbara is to the right. So it's interesting when you stumble upon family history while you're just hiking in the woods. Um, what an important thing to keep in mind is your mindset as a genealogist. A lot, I, a lot of people tell me I'm not a historian. I'm not a writer. I'm not a researcher. I'm not good at keeping all these people straight. There are solutions for all of those things. If you're not a historian, there are solutions for that. There are things to read. There are timelines. Um, if you're not a writer, you don't have to be a writer to be a genealogist. Although you do want to figure out some way to preserve what you're finding, you don't have to write a big story. You can make a picture book. Uh, so some of the things that we'll talk about in future, um, future talks and future videos is how do you do that? How do you compile something that's interesting that will draw the members of your family in? You may not be a researcher, but every one of us at some point in our lives has written some kind of research paper. We've learned a little bit about footnotes or citations or citing our sources. So you do probably already have all the basic tools that you need in order to research. If you have a good imagination, how, what's another way I could spell that name? Where's another place they could have lived? What could have happened to so-and-so when you know they dropped off the census? Where could they have gone? So if you have a good imagination, that almost is more important than being a good solid researcher. Um, and if you're not good at keeping all those people straight, particularly if your family is like most of ours, where there's lots of John Reeds, lots of William Reeds in the family line, there are tools that you can use to keep track of which person is which. And some of those are online tools, but some of them are also paper pencil tools. So we'll talk about those. You have a lot of advantages if you're starting to research now, particularly if you're an older person. Because of your aging experience, you know how to read cursive. Most uh, students today in school are not learning that. And most documents are in cursive. Uh, you may have a foreign language skill. You may know how to read Spanish or German. Um, you know history. The people that I talk to who are over 50 know a lot more history than the millennials. Uh, you have a framework. You have a timeline. You've lived longer. You remember more. And you also know how to write letters. Letter writing is a great way to do genealogy, paper and pencil, not electronic. Uh, writing to archives, writing to cousins, writing to other family members, and trying to collect information, what we would say is the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way is still just as good. So some of the basic premises that you should use to guide you. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? So the assumption that you have, does it make sense? OK, if you think it makes sense, go ahead and try to prove it. If it's not very easily provable. If you walk the perimeter of all the Catholic cemeteries in Patterson, New Jersey, and you haven't found what you were looking for, think about it in a different way. Step back a little bit. You know, am I being unbiased? Am I approaching it like a detective? Did I believe someone who told me a story that's not necessarily true? Are my assumptions too narrow? And one of the things that uh, people talk about, at least in medical terms, they talk about a horse is a horse, not a zebra. And Sometimes we're looking for the zebra when really a horse is a horse. And so genealogy is about normal, average, not very terribly famous people. And sometimes the most obvious answer is actually the correct one. And so where we might be looking for royalty or a Native American princess or a Mayflower ancestor, it may not be true. And so think about in terms of ordinary people. What would ordinary people have been doing in the 1750s? Most of them might have been farmers or working in a blacksmith shop or something like that. So think about things in a timeline and think about things in terms of normal, average, ordinary people. The other thing that uh, comes up quite a lot is 
you know, people tell me, well, I'm, I'm done. I've got my family traced back to the 1600s. I'm done. Well, when you think about it in terms of the numbers, if you have 256 six great grandparents, are you ever done? <laughs> you know, because you have seven great grandparents. So you have eight great grandparents. It's really not, there's really no finish line. Um, it's a lifelong process. We all have lots of unknowns. I tell people all the time that the letter U for unknown in my family tree is the largest surname group that I have. Uh, it's, we have lots and lots and lots of women who have unknown surnames. And so there, it's something that is a lifelong process. Uh, another thing that I've learned is that not everyone plays nice in the sandbox. Um, some people are territorial about their photos. They don't want you to copy their documents. They're uninterested in sharing, that sort of thing. Um, I have a hard time understanding those kind of people, um, <laughs> especially if they're my cousins and we're talking about a common grandparent or great-grandparent that's my great-grandparent as well as theirs. Um, but you have to take people at where they're at. So if they're not willing to share, they're not willing to talk, they're not willing to discuss, then that's the way it is. And you move on to the next person who might be willing to work with you or share with you. Um, also, another thing to do that will help you uh, jumpstart your genealogy is to follow the blaze trail. Uh, there are people who have gone before you that have compiled information. Sometimes there's someone in your family or you inherit a box of stuff from a great aunt somewhere. But sometimes there are written family histories online, in libraries, um, bound books. And I would say for the most part, uh, those should be seen as secondary sources that will give you good leads, good information, but not necessarily accurate. Um, so just be cautious with that information. Uh, one of the things that I do when I find a family history that's typed or written or compiled is I will add names to my tree based on what they think the lineage is. I'll add names to my tree and then I'll kind of vet out what well, does that make sense? You know, is that possible? Are these children possible? Is there a mistake or is it correct? And so I use that kind of as a springboard. So it's exciting to find a book where someone has mapped you back to, uh, I don't know, some King Henry, <laughs> but it's probably a good idea to take a really good look at that. Also, rethink what you know about distance and mileage and migration and immigration and travel. You know, in, in this century, we live at a time where we can hop on a plane, buses, boats, trains, and we can get pretty much anywhere we want in the United States within the day. And so think about it in terms of how far did people really go in the 1600s or 1700s in this country? How far did people really migrate? How many generations were in one place for a really long time? Um, and look locally. If there's somebody missing, they didn't have to go very far to become anonymous again. So even if someone was kind of the black sheep of the family and all of a sudden, you know, they got kicked out of the family for whatever reason, they may not have gone very far. You know, they may not have gone from Ohio to Florida. They may have just gone from Columbus, Ohio to Cleveland. So think about things in terms of distance, how long it would take to get there and that sort of thing road conditions, wagon trails, you know, so how far could people really go? So try to think about transportation, distance, and those sorts of things in the time era that you're researching. So what's coming this year? What kind of things are, am I going to talk about on YouTube this year and post videos about? Software. Um, if you've not used software before, we're going to talk about a lot of different kinds of software. Also, historical societies and where to search. Different archives, national archives, multi-state, uh, topical archives, state, regional, local, and county and library archives. I have a photo album in here, but I'm not going to show that now. It's just a photo album of some of the different kinds of archives. Also, we're going to talk about websites, uh, genealogy on the computer, how to search, tips and tricks, uh, what are Boolean operators, the types of search things that help you 
get the most out of your search engine. Um, what type, types of blogs are there? Uh, I listed Dick Eastman here, very famous uh, genealogy blog. Wide range of topics, lots of things um, interest you there. But search around for blogs. Just search genealogy and blogs. If you're interested in genealogical organization, you can search for my blog, which is Mess on the Desk. And that would give you a lot of different tips and tricks of how to organize your genealogy. We'll talk about Facebook, society, web pages. And if you want to get started now on some of these digital searching and record searching online, I've listed some sites here. Some are free and some cost money. But again, Ancestry.com is free at your local library if they have a library prescription, subscription. And most libraries do. We're also going to talk uh, this year about devices and tools and how to use computers and tablets like the iPad and smartphones and readers like Kindle and Nook and cameras and scanners and some of those other types of things. I also have here um, external hard drives, flash drives. So we're going to talk about some of the devices and tools that you can use for researching, archiving, and also preserving. So we're going to kind of hit those major areas this year as well. How do you get organized? How do you organize your paper? How do you organize digitally if you choose to? Uh, how can you organize using a research log, which is a method that you can use in order to research one particular question at a time, um, and how to thoroughly research that? Uh, how do you use OneNote or Evernote or another online organizational program? Uh, Evernote is online and it's free. OneNote is uh, part of the Office, Microsoft Office suite of programs. And then also, how do you organize your photos? Um, what do you do for backup? And what happens to all of it when you're gone? So those are some of the upcoming topics we'll have. And DNA testing. Uh, one thing that I caution about DNA testing is you really have to answer some tough questions before you do that. But this is something we're going to do a series on. Are you OK finding out that grandma lied about grandpa <laughs> or who your grandfather is? Um, what if someone contacts you and says that they were adopted? I've recently worked with an adoptee looking for her biological father. So you know, how do you contact people? What do you do if someone says to you, hey, I might be your half-brother or half-sister? You know, are you ready for that? Uh, what if your DNA analysis shows that you're not really Irish and you thought you were? Um, you know, there are, are identity types of things that come with this. And do you have prejudices that might be difficult to accept? Uh, what if you find out that you're part Jewish or part Native American or part different race and, and you're not uh, willing to accept that or be open to that? Those, those are some kind of things that you should think about in terms of um, being ready for the results. Also, you need to understand the results. And, you know, I have a cousin, a Robinson cousin, um, who had contacted me and asked um, to have some of my family members tested because he had been tested against all the other Robisons that he had found, and he wasn't matching them as a DNA match. Now, that doesn't mean he's not a Robison, uh, but it means he's not matching any of the Robisons out there. And DNA testing is limited. I mean, it's testing a very, very small piece um, of the total amount of your DNA. So uh, you need to understand what the results mean, but also be willing to understand that you may not be a Robeson. You may not actually belong to the family group that you think you do. And that's something that, you know, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but it is something really important. We we'll also learned about DNA testing and what does it mean to have a Y DNA test along your father's family line a mitochondrial DNA test along your mother's family line, and then what is the autosomal DNA test in COMPASS? So there are three major types of DNA testing, so we'll learn about that this year. And then we'll have some question and answer sessions where I hope that people will write in questions and then we'll talk about that. We'll talk about continuing education. So what kind of conferences can you go to? And I've listed a couple of here that are my favorite. Um, in Ohio, we have a wonderful conference uh, that brings in nationally known speakers. Uh, it's three or four days. Um, 
this year it's in Mason, Ohio, and in the summer in Springfield, Illinois, is the Federation of Genealogical Societies Conference. That's one of my absolute favorites. And um, also there are some online conferences. There's a Genetic Genealogy Online Conference. It's a one day, Thursday, all day. Uh, you pay to be part of the webinar series, and then you can view the webinars. I believe it's for a month, up to a month afterwards. So a lot of information in a very short time, but you also can watch them on demand. So that's something to keep in mind. We'll talk about those as those come up. And you can do research trips. You can get on a bus. You can find a buddy. You can research. And we'll close with this. Um, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? And that's one of the major things about um, genealogy. This is a quote from John Lewis, a former freedom writer. But I would just say that let's apply that to a genealogical pursuit. If we're not going to learn about it and study about it, then who? And if it's not us now, then when? So I would encourage you to use some of these tools that you found today. Go to your local library. Get a five-generation chart. Get started on that. And then meet me back here next time for another video on what to do next.